Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zev from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am visiting the county of Warwickshire in the Midlands of the United Kingdom to visit a good buddy of mine, Sam Cooper. Sam, how are you doing? I'm very good, thanks Zed. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, I appreciate you having me down uh, here. Happy to have you here. Um, so Sam is actually a fellow Londoner like myself, but currently he's doing an apprenticeship here in Warwickshire with Lawrence. Um, and would you care to explain a little bit more on kind of what you're doing here in terms of your apprenticeship? Yeah, so um, I've been working here with Lawrence for about 18, 19 months now, um, training as a rush seated uh, ladder back chair maker. So Lawrence is the last guy in the country making these full time. Um, and you can date his, um, he's sort of part of a, a long lineage of craftsmen dating back to the 1800s with Philip Clissett and Ernest Jimson. Uh, so we are, or Rich and myself, the other apprentice, we're now the sixth, I think seventh generation um, in this line of chair makers. Um, yeah, so we're making for another couple months here with Lawrence uh, and then uh, Lawrence is sort of coming up to retirement. So we'll be opening up our own workshop um, up in Scotland in a few months time. Living the dream, man, yeah. up in the Highlands. Go and check that out. So uh, Sam and myself, we've known each other for quite a while now. And uh, I've seen Sam kind of rise through the ranks in the Greenwood working community. Now, obviously, Sam is doing a full time apprenticeship with the chair making. Um, and aside from that, he's a very well respected spoon carver. You know, he's very, very talented. He's someone I look up to in terms of his skills and what he's kind of producing in terms of his green woodwork. You also do a lot of turning as well, don't you? Uh, bowl turning and whatnot. Yeah, uh, did um, build your bowl bowl lathe course with Yoav and Will, uh, Will Sinclair a couple of years back. Right. Uh, got hooked on it. I've uh, got my lathe set up in the back garden of the workshop here uh, and turn whenever I, whenever I can basically. It's usually lunch breaks or occasionally the odd weekend if it's good weather, come in and get the lathe going again. Yeah, so he's got his whole setup here. So what we're going to do shortly um, is we're going to have just a very quick sneak peek inside the workshop with the chair making going on. Uh, we don't want to disturb the kind of guys, Lawrence and the other apprentices kind of working away, but we will have just a very quick look so you can get a bit of an insight into what Sam is doing here. Um, and like Sam mentioned, you know, he's kind of, once he finishes up here in the next couple of months, he'll be moving up to Scotland. And who knows in the future, maybe a collaboration where I'll come, I have a visit actually uh, planned to Scotland. So hopefully maybe pass through kind of Sam's abode and see kind of what, you, yeah, uh, what you're up to. Um, so Sam has very kindly allowed me to come down today to document his personal process for carving a spoon from start to finish. Like I said, Sam is someone I respect quite, quite a bit in terms of his skills and what he's able to produce. Um, now, am I mistaken in saying this is probably the first time you're actually showing your process in such detail in a public setting? Yeah, or... I mean, I've done a couple of sort of small videos myself, but never like the whole process through and through. And I, yeah, I doubt in as much detail as you'll likely get out of it. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a great honor for me and obviously a real treat for you guys. And this is gonna be the first time I see Sam's entire process as well. So, you know, just like yourself, it's gonna be a real treat to see how Sam approaches the entire process from start to finish. So here's what we're gonna do in this video. Like I said, in a moment, we're just gonna have a quick peek inside the workshop to see the chair making side of things. And then we're gonna return back here. And in terms of the process of this video, it's gonna be outlined as the following. First, we're gonna have a little look at a small selection of Sam's carvings. Uh, in terms of some of the spoons he's already carved up until now. Um, I mean, most of the ones obviously you carve uh, are passed on, aren't they, in terms of being sold and whatnot? Yeah, I'm, I'm not as good at that as I should be. I, I tend to get attached to quite a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. So um, at the end of the day, like I, I carve spoons because I like carving spoons. I'm, I'm not really carving to sell them. So most of them end up sticking with me for a while right. until I either give them away or think, oh, actually, I need some money now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bless. So like I said, he's got a small selection here. So you can kind of see the work that Sam does. And then we're going to get straight into the making process, starting off obviously from the raw piece of wood and going through all the way to a finished spoon. So like I said, we're going to pop into the workshop now to have a quick look inside the chair making process that Sam and the other apprentice are working with, with Lawrence. Uh, and then we're going to return back here and begin this video where Sam Cooper is going to be teaching you from start to finish how to carve a spoon. So Sam, just kind of a brief overview of the process for the chair making. Is this where it all starts? Yes, yeah, so this is where it all starts. We um, our wood pile at the back. It's pretty depleted at the moment, but uh, we start off with we get our ash, uh, green ash, in about seven foot lengths. Um, 
they're all under the tins, we just keep them out of the weather basically. We buy them that long because it seven foot gets us usually two back legs out of it so we can saw it in half and then yeah two back legs to turn. So start with the log screen out here. If they're small enough we can put put them straight onto the saw bench. I'll show you that in a second. If not then we'll usually saw them up with a chainsaw first and or two to length and then split them just to make them a bit smaller and easier to manage. Uh, but bring you in here I'll show you the saw shed where we process them down. So this is our great big circular saw. That is a 22 inch um, blade on there. Oof, gosh. Which, uh, as you can imagine, is probably not up to health and safety specs. Doesn't sort of stop in the recommended eight seconds or anything like that. Um, but it will cut through literally anything. Um, so we can put whole logs on here, rip it down, a nice fence so we can control the thickness so we'll saw everything down into legs um, sort of that sort of size um, yeah we'd saw it square and then just take off the corners as well with the saw take and make them octagonal make them a bit easier to turn so yeah we'll sort everything on there saw the legs saw the spars um, the slats everything and then we bring that into into the main workshop if we just Uh, yeah, so once everything is sawn up, first stage is we need to come over to the lathe. Um, this one, as you can see, is basically built into the building. Um, so it's pretty old, and I don't think we're going to be able to move it out in the future. But that one, that's our slightly longer lathe, so we can turn legs up to our, our longest one is 48 inches long. So we'll turn all the back legs, spars and everything on there. Spars then go over our wood stove dry out, make sure they're nice and dry before we put the chairs together, otherwise it gets loose and it gets wobbly. Here we've got the spars and seat rails for the backs of the set we're building at the moment and the arms for some LCC chairs that we're building as well, just getting a nice cooking over the stove. Once all the legs are turned, um, we need to bend them, that's what this great big thing is for, it's an immersion boiler, it's about 10 gallons, uh, takes absolutely ages to boil as you can imagine so we have to start at the beginning of the day and legs are ready to be bent by sort of mid-afternoon three three ish um yeah so we can fit all the legs and then the slats for the back of the chair in this boil them they go into a bending frame which are back out in the saw shed stay in there for about a week or so to dry um, and then we can take them out uh, drill them back on the lathe again uh, and then start fitting the slats to the to the legs, just like Rich is doing at the moment. Uh, as you can see, this is a uh, Russell armchair that Rich is working on at the moment. Is that right? <laughs> We've drilled and mortised the back leg now, and he's just fitting the slats. So you take a little bit of material off the slats, you get a nice snug fit in the back so that it doesn't wobble or get loose. So it's all assembled here then basically? Yeah, all yeah. assembled here. So you can see um, just to your left there's some of the backs that Rich has already fitted today. Um, once he's finished, or once we've finished the fitting, they'll then be drilled again so that we can put the spars and seat rails in. And then they'll be paired up to the fronts, which we assembled the other day. These are... These are for a slightly taller than normal armchair. It's a, a customer asked for one with a 54 inch, 54 centimeter 
C-Type 54 inch would be ridiculous. <laughs> it's not that big, is it? <laughs> um, Yeah, so once the backs are finished, we'll pair them up with these uh, and there'll be a little bit of adjustment to make sure they're level. Uh, but then, they'll look like this. This is one of the frames. This is a uh, Ledbury armchair that we finished the other day. That's why it's got slightly different looking seat rails. These have an arm support which passes through the seat and joins up with that spar underneath. So it will look like that for a few days until we get around to seating it. And then we'll be yeah, seating it. So this is um, English River Rush that we harvest ourselves from the river. And with that, that, that's then twisted together into strands to make the seat. So this is all the rush behind here then? Basically. Yeah, that's the rush behind there. So uh, we take about it takes about four hours or so to do a seat, or at least I'm, I'm just about cracking four hours now. Rich is a faster seater than me, so he's doing them in a, just over three hours. Um, Lawrence is about four and a bit hours, maybe five. Um, and then once that's all kind of seated up, is it left to dry or is that pretty much it, ready to go? Or? Yeah, it's left to dry a little bit. The, the seats um, will dry over time, so they, it's usually good to go um, in a few days. We'll, um, yeah, once we finish the seating, there's a couple of days what, before we tend to seat all the chairs in a set at once. So it might be 12 to 15 in a set. Seat them all uh, and then there'll be a couple of days and they'll uh, sand and whack, put a wax polish on afterwards. So Sam, obviously we have a small selection here of your spoons. Um, where would you like to begin in terms of showing the viewers? Uh, uh, start probably with uh, this one on the end just here, um, purely because it's, it's the last one I carved. Um, finished this a, a couple of nights ago. It's a nice bit of a uh, sycamore. Um, there was a little bit of ripple in it, but uh, I think uh, most of that's carved out. It's uh, been baked a bit, which is why it's a dark color. It's a nice, simple eater, like a new bowl shape I'm sort of trying out. I usually do this, but quite asymmetric. Um, I want to try something a bit more um, uniform and uh, good for lefties and righties. Um, then moving on next to that, this uh, this was a tester I, I did a, quite a while back. It's the sort of the favorite shape I do at the moment, which uh, sort of like, almost like a snakehead si style bowl. Um, but then with a nice sort of belly on the handle, nice, really nice curves to it, I think. Uh, Deborah uh, Schneebly and Morell uh, and Jane Myatt, they, they call these the sort of mu spoons. They're very feminine form on the handle. Uh, yeah, the experiment on this one was um, a dyed back, so I, I call it the silver back spoon because um, it's, uh, yeah, pretty obvious. It's, uh, so it's um, hazel and iron wool, or uh, hazel and then the dye is from oak bark and iron wool on the back, so it just turns hazel a really lovely silvery color. Um, and it's pretty permanent and pretty food safe. So. Uh, what else have I got here? Uh, that's another little sycamore that's sort of a, a little shallow scoop slash eater hybrid. Um, really lovely bit of ripply sycamore. Um, I get most of my wood from, um, sort of some of it from the local hedgerows, some of it from the farms. A lot of this sycamore recently has come from my fellow apprentice Rich's woods um, or back at his parents' place. They've got some uh, woodland and some trees. Uh, a lot of it's come up from Scotland as well. For the We've been up to check out the new workshop for the chair making a few times. Uh, and I think we were up there February last year, just after some of the big storms. We've got a, a couple of big lo logs of beech to bring back with us, which is one of my favorite woods to carve. So we brought some of that. That's one of the spoons carved from that. It's uh, Getting a bit old now, but that's another one from the same batch with a bit of a, I think that was blue leather dye on it. Um, it's just another a little experiment to see what sort of surfaces worked well. Um, moving on, another bit, another favorite wood, uh, that's a bit of damson. Uh, I carved that when it was bone dry, um, but it's just, it's such a lovely wood to carve. Even when it's green, it's so dense. You get such a lovely finish. I do most of my carving um, like when it's completely green, a lot of people um, carve their spoons green and then sort of do finishing cuts when it's dried out a bit. I tend to do it all in one go. Um, yeah, which, which is why I like the denser woods like beech and uh, damson and stuff, just because you can get a better finish by carving it all when it's green. It's just a bit easier to carve. Um, 
more, what have we got? Some cherry, uh, some really lovely cherry I've got. It's been down for a couple of years or so. It's from, um, a friend has some woodland down in Sussex. Um, and we went to, went to get a couple of logs from trees which have been down for a couple of years. So it's, it's sort of stewed nicely and sapwood has pretty much rotted away, but the heartwood is still really lovely to carve. Dried out a little bit, but really soft. So it's uh, dead easy to carve. Just been made it really easy for me to carve a couple of big spoons out of it, actually. I don't tend to do that many big spoons. Um, it's something I've, I've always thought they can be a little bit wasteful um, in terms of the amount of material that's gone into that. I can usually get two smaller spoons out of sort of thing. So I tend to shy away from them, but I've been pushing myself to do a few more recently. This particular one has a nice bit of sap discoloration. That's the, the cambium layer you can see up there, the black. Um, and another big ladle is from straight grain wood, which was just a challenge. Like you, I don't get much, many big crooks, anything to do big ladles. So it's nice to try and do it from a nice big bit of flat wood and get a decent crank out of it. Uh, another one I carve pretty regularly, hazel. Uh, again, the friend who has uh, some woods down in Sussex, um, it's predominantly a ash uh, woodland, um, but there's hazel in the understory and there's a bank of cherry in one section. So um, we've I've gone down and the, the hazel coppice is overgrown quite a lot. So it's, there's some really lovely wood in there, which I can get every now and then. Uh, what else have we got here? It's a bit more sycamore, another bit of sycamore, which has been baked. This is another little bit of sycamore, but this is one of my favorite things to carve. These are little balancing scoops. If you can see, just sits in a nice position with the handle still tipped up in the air. Um, it's about two, two tablespoons level, um, good size for a coffee I always find. Um, so I, I usually make them about two tablespoons for coffee beans, coffee grounds. They balance on, in one position and then when they're full, they'll usually tip forward and balance in a slightly different position. It makes them easier to pick up if you put them down. Another little one with the same sort of balancing, just a uh, little bit smaller. Um, a bit of coal rosing on the handle, simple coal rosing. Um, this, that is a bit of elm. Uh, that's from the hedgerow on the way to work. The uh, farmers took down, um, there's a lot of small elm around here and the farmers took down a couple of branches which had um, snapped and block in the path. So salvage some of that. Uh, this is one of my favorite spoons. It's one I've been keeping hold of for a while now. I think there's a few people I've promised to sell it to and not done. It's a lovely bit of really ripple, really colorful sycamore I got from back when I was living in London, maybe three years ago. Um, and this was sort of when I first, first really got into coal rosing and started doing um, not just sort of geometric patterns, but I started trying to do landscapes and um, all that sort of stuff. A uh, bit more cherry. This is all the cherry from my friend's woods. It's another bit of beach. Um, nice exercise, leaving a bit of sort of natural weather texture. So I, that was from a beach crook, which I started, uh, split off the back of it, basically. Tried to get two, two ones out of it and nest, nest the crooks left the, the off cut for a couple of months, came back to it and had picked up that nice sort of color from the rain and the wind. Um, and I thought, yeah, good look to leave on the spoon. Uh, there was one other I was gonna show, which is just blown away. That is eucalyptus. It's the only bit of eucalyptus I've ever had, which didn't twist like hell. Um, is that what it's prone to doing? Yeah, like most other times I've used eucalyptus, it throws itself all over the place, it twists itself apart, it cracks pretty freely. This was a really steep crank I got at Spoonfest last year, which uh, Rob Duckmanton told me to stay the hell away from, because um, there's no point even trying to split it open, but it turns into a really lovely spoon. Um, I mean, it's a bit too cranky to be used, but it's nice to look at. <laughs> so in terms of the uh, demonstration today, what style of spoon are you gonna go for? In terms Probably of gonna do, um, one like this, I'm gonna do like a sort of standard eating size spoon. This one's a, a right-handed, slightly asymmetric. So I might do one which is a bit more symmetrical. Uh, probably do a sort of flat fronted, quite a, uh, I call them a snake head bowl. Um, and then with a nice, nice curve to the handle, I'll probably do something like that. So 
So Sam, what wood are we going to be working with? I'm going to start off, I've got a nice little length of hazel. Um, this is from an overgrown coppice down in uh, Sussex. Um, yeah, it's just a really nice um, softwood to carve. It's probably a little bit longer than I usually use for this kind of spoon, but um, I'm guard it. I'll probably get split it in half, get two blanks out of this piece. It's about about three inch across, maybe just shy of that. So it should be enough. There's enough material there to get a good depth on the crank for a spoon as well. Excellent. And like. um, what axe are you going to be using? This is uh, Hans Carlson. Um, it's their, their carving axe. I've had this for about a year and a half now. And, uh, absolutely love it it's uh used to be hollow ground you can see that i've sharpened that out on one side now but the other not but it's a really lovely weight it's about i think 750 grams odd including the handle but really lovely weight nice close handle i've got the nice finger well under under the actual bit of it which means i can choke up i tend to hold it up here for most of the time it means i get a really nice controlled grip and control position with the axe blade excellent so when you're ready, I think we'll begin. Yeah, all right. First job first, as I said, it's a nice bit of hazel. I've got a crack you can just see starting across there. I think that's probably from when I chopped it down. But we'll just follow that line. There we go. Two ready made. It's ever so slight twist, but that's not really anything to worry about. Um, yeah, we usually carve that out as we go. I might just take that out quickly now. Yeah, that's the worst of it. We'll sort the rest out later. Um, so yeah, starting with a, a log about this sort of size. Um, first thing I'll do is basically make it a bit square and make it a bit easier for me to work with. So I take the sides off. This just means um, with those sort of flat sides, I can lay it flat on the block. It gives me a nice steady position to hold it in when I'm axing out. So first job um, I do after that, first job I always do on a spoon, um, doesn't matter what, is axing the crank. I think it's the bit I find most likely to put a crack into it or to break anything. So I usually try and get that over and done with, it means doing any less work or less risk later on where you're, there's less material basically. So start off, you can do this with a saw, but I do it, usually do it with an ax, about two and a half inches in. Just start chopping 45 degree angle towards the end. Do it much steeper than that, and then you risk taking that section out and putting a crack running down it. But just chop in, get it. A little deep just get a nice crank in there that's probably deep enough and then switch approach this is where that flat comes in handy so I can lock it in place I've got my hand at the other end of the billet plenty of wood in between the hand and the uh, hand and the axe so I'm not really in danger of cutting myself at all then just chop down across the grain to meet that first cut There we go. I mean, that's. I think I want to take that a little bit deeper, just so I've got a bit more crank in it. Occasionally, I'll just bring it up that way. Once I've got that crank you don't want to be axing like that because it's close to your hand but once I've got that cut in that way I can then just clean it up either way that looks all right uh, next up then curve your handle so take it down to meet that started with a round bit of wood so the first step I usually do you can skip but I'll just show it anyway which is 
take the corners down so you want to meet that crank there. It's all about sort of making your life a little bit easier um, and rather than taking one big flat of wood out, if you're taking the corners, it's just a little bit easier. You're cutting through less wood. You then end up with a ridge down the middle, which is just a little bit easier to carve down. You don't need to put as much force into it so you don't risk going into the bowl. That's most of it done. That's a bit steep there now still, so I'll go back to the side method and just cut across the grain. I say across the grain, I'm sort of cutting it almost like a 45 degree angle, making a nice sweep with the ax. So you're getting a sloping cut, slicing cut down across the grain into that original line. And yeah, that's about done for crank. That's move on to take some weight out the blank now. Um, yeah, so then I'll just flip it over, start it on the back. It can be pretty heavy with the ax here, so to move my grip down a little bit. There's still a good amount of material there, so you can be nice and aggressive. No, so I've got this block, helps me just anchor um, everything in. It's a tip I picked up from Anna Cassily. Um, makes the block a lot more versatile. You've got something you can lean on, something gives you a bit more control over your billet. Uh, yeah, take the bowl down first. Don't know why I tend to work that side, just, just do, and then take a bit more weight out the back. Again, working sort of 45 degree angle, take off the corners, most of the weight out. Then you've got a thinner spot on the back again. So just come down. Again, I'll work at a slight angle here. Just makes things easier. Still a little bit thick. Let's just take a bit more off that way. Yeah, and that's probably enough for that section. Uh, next thing to do, be draw my rough shape on, and then I can start sort of axing it in the profile. So I'll start off just with a center line. This isn't gonna be particularly central or particularly straight, but it will do the job. Uh, and then start to mark out where I want my bowl to be. So I try and aim to have this crank line maybe about a fifth from the back of the bowl. So I'll put my neck in here. Start, bring out one side. I tend to aim for a bowl about um, inch and three quarter, inch and five eighths wide. Uh, 44 odd mil if you're metric. Um, bring out, try and get them symmetrical aim usually I do most of that later it's better easy to see that with a knife later but bring the bowl forward taper it nice flat across the front I'm not mad on the 
like traditional sort of pointy bowls. Just flip it round. A bit more of a flat in there, I think. And that side isn't coming out far enough. Yeah, that'll about do for the bowl shape, I think. Um, I'll probably adjust it a little bit as I'm carving. I usually leave it a little bit extra on with an ax and then you can always change it later. It's a lot easier to do once you've got your knife on it and you can make those fine adjustments by holding it up and using the silhouette. Then I'll draw my handle on. Um, we're gonna do, as we said, a slight swell in it. So we'll get a nice curve coming out from there. Again, if it's too wide here, it looks out of proportion with the bowl. So I tend to try and keep it maximum sort of half the width of the bowl in total. So if you look here, from the center line to the edge of the bowl, it's about the width of my thumb. So we're gonna try and do the same sort of thing on the handle. Taper out, I want that about, about as far from the end of the bowl as the neck is to the widest point. and then just bring it gently back in. I don't like to go too fine at the end. So we'll go, probably stop just at that bark line. So it's got a sort of, almost a fish shaped handle actually. I'm just gonna make that bowl. My portions might be a bit off here. So I made that bowl a little bit longer. I'm just curious while you're doing this, do you typically work with templates or do you always draw freehand? Always draw freehand. I, I think I started out with templates for a while when I was doing, um, I did for a, a summer, I was doing batch production. I'd sort of do sets of 10 to 15 at a time. Um, but most of the time, in fact, all, all the time now, I just, I just draw it on at the time. Um, I get a little bit bored if I'm doing the same design over and over again. So there's a nice natural variation from drawing it each time. Um, I will make this particular design as a template though. Uh, if you got any, anybody wants to make this kind of spoon. Um, uh, would that be okay for you to do that? Yeah, that's no problem. With the thing, yeah. So guys, we'll stress it at the end, but I think what we'll do with Sam's kind permission, we'll create a blog post, I think on your website. Um, and then you guys can check out the link below in the description. If you click on that, then yeah, Sam very kindly will give you a template you can download to kind of replicate this spoon. That would be awesome, Sam, thank you. No worries. Um, yeah, next step of axing out. So I've got my, my rough profile drawn in. Um, first thing is just, just more weight out of it, basically. So again, you can be fairly aggressive. See, I've still got a close grip, just I don't want to go into the side of my bowl there, but. I'll do that taper first. Se that taper second. Uh, I managed to draw my spoon about not exactly in the center of the billet, so a bit more off this side. Yeah, that's about as close to the lines as I need to be, really. Um, hazel is nice and soft, so. It won't take much time to clean that off with the, the knife later. Uh, then the back uh, or the handle side. Again, I want to start up nice and high. And then I'll probably just take a, a little bit of weight out further down. Then I've got my cut to start off with up here. I just want to taper it down at the moment. I don't need to worry about going into the neck of the spoon or anything. Just taper it down to your widest point, the little flare and all that. Check that it's square. I've got a bad habit of twisting my cuts. But that looks all right. I'll just do the other side as well.
Yeah, it's most of the weight taken out. Um, you can now see, looking at the side profile again, that I'd thinned it out on the edges a bit more. I've now got quite a bit more material. That's a lot more material than I'd like to remove with the knife. So I just go back at the back with an ax again. Before I take the neck down, the neck is the most fragile part of it. So if I can take this out while it's still chunky, then it makes things a lot less risky. Just thin that out a little bit. Same the other side. And then same for the handle as well. Got I don't want to take too much out of the back because um, I'll use the knife to put a bit more curve into that handle, something to give it a bit more of a, well, a bit of a better feel. Yes, yeah, so that's probably about as far as I'd take it for that section. Um, and yeah, now I'll axe in the neck. So again, this is where the block comes in handy. Hold it at sort of roughly 45 degree angle. I'm going to chop down actually fairly close to where that crank starts, but just, and then work my way up. Just severing the longer fibers until I get close to the shoulder of the bowl. And then I'll just start, at the moment my axe is just dropping straight down, I'll start slicing it in slightly. Helps me get into that cove. And then I can come down. Uh, it's where we're going to need to switch the block around a little bit. Can use that. Ooh, legs coming out. Can use this block now as a depth stop to help me stop going into the side of the bowl. So, helpfully, I'm doing the wrong side first, but you can chop down into that. You can see that the axe is hitting that block before I can get anywhere near the bowl. So, usually it will split out. That, that side, but I'm not at risk of putting any marks into the back of the bowl. Got rid of most of the material there, bring it back this way. And then back to Maybe cut the blank a little bit short for you to using the black that block there. Yeah, that's one side. Just do the same on the other. Now we've got that first side cut as well. There's a nice shoulder to hold it steady on on the block. So again, we'll start a bit further down, work our way up towards the back of the shoulder. Be able to get a better view of the how the block works at a depth stop here so you can see me starting up here come to meet down and just about there the toe of my axe or the heel of my axe is hitting the block so i can't physically get it into the back of the bowl i used to do that a lot when i started out where i put a crack in it um, and then yeah once there's a crack in the back of the bowl it's very hard to carve out this just takes a little bit of that risk out you can still do it, but it's just a lot less likely. Again, I'm always trying to keep the axe sort of vertical and just drop it down. So I'll, that's why I leave a bit of point on the tip of the bowl and start it up here and then just pivot the, pivot the spoon with the cut. Just 
switch over to that way to clean that out again quickly. And one last. Yeah, that's probably about done. I'm just gonna take a little bit of weight out the back of the shoulders. It's hazel, so it's nice and soft, but it's just a little bit less work to do later with the knife. Yeah, there we go. That's the axe work finished. With a denser wood, I might take it a little bit close to the lines but uh, something soft like hazel, really easy to do with a knife, so I'll leave it there. So Sam, what's next in the process? Uh, after the axe work, move on to knife work. So um, it'll be sloyd knife to start off with. So I've got a um, nice sloyd knife. This is a Nick Westerman. I managed to pick up secondhand. A guy on selling on eBay, he'd uh, snap the tip off and couldn't be bothered to resharpen it. So or didn't know how to resharpen it. So got it in, at a bargain, put my own handle on it, and it's a uh, yeah, really, really lovely knife. Uh, yeah, so we'll start off. Uh, I'm just gonna clean up the profile, basically try and get down to where my pencil lines are. I know they're not the greatest lines, but start off front of the bowl. It's nice and soft, so I can take kind of aggressive cuts. I taught myself most of the knife work myself, so there's a reason you won't see me using some of like the sort of safe techniques like chest lever techniques, stuff like that, that a lot of other people teach. It's not because it's a bad technique, it's just not the way I taught myself, basically. I tend to do a lot of thumb pushes, which is why my hands are so calloused. shoulders. So you're using the tip of the spoon for the, the tighter curves? Yeah, using the, the end of the knife, obviously there's a bit less blade there so you can get closer down into the curves. Uh, and I find you just, it's, it's not just sort of getting in and out of the curves, it takes off less material where if you're using the sort of the wider, the belly of the blade, then you can take off more material. Um, but if you're trying to take off less material and do a curve, then you need that just the thinness at the end, there's a, you can see there's a slight taper to the blade and that helps with the sort of the grind starting up there. But um, yeah, you need that taper just to, to get into the tight curves. Just bring that round again. So I tend to work at it from both sides. I'll turn, come from the, the back of the bowl in towards the neck and then flip it around and work into the neck from that side, meet in the middle and get take off the nice shaving like that. I'm not sure this knife is as sharp as I really should keep it, so there might be a little bit of tear out across that middle. So another me method I use to try and minimize that tear out is rather than taking the whole cut in one go, do your first third, star line, second third, just work your way across it, basically taking a small shaving each time. And if you can, slice with your cut as well. So don't just sort of push through. If you get a nice slicing motion, you can see your hand twisting and moving away and the knife pulling through. Nice way to sever the fibers evenly without the risk of 
causing cracks which run through it. Uh, that's not a very nice shape at the moment. It's a bit too sharp, so I'm just gonna take that corner off. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Do the same on the other side. I tend to work from the bowl backwards, if you know what I mean, um, on a spoon. So I'll do all the refining of the profile of the bowl first and then work my way back on the handle. That way I always find it's easier to sort of correct your shape and um, if your handle is a bit wonky, it's easier to correct that in the handle than it is in the bowl. It's not the end of the world making a slightly narrower handle. It's uh, less comfortable when you've got a really narrow spoon bowl. See, I'm not really looking at like my profile when I'm carving from the side. You can usually tell, I can tell sort of how close you're getting to the lines by how much material you're taking off. So that's quite a fine shape because I know I'm not in danger of carving into my pattern basically. probably about done. Just need to take a little bit more of that back shoulder. It's a bit uneven. Still a bit uneven. Um. Yeah, that'll do for now. I'll clean up this profile a bit later, so I tend to sort of define that now, get my symmetry okay, make sure I've got the right shape, and then I'll rough it out. And once I've, it's all a bit thinner, then it's a bit easier to make those fine adjustments because there's less material to remove in one go. Uh, now I'll work up the handle of the spoon, so just take out a bit more there. got to cut the curve like that back curve in so I'll, to do this rather than come in just sort of parallel to grain I'll take off that top corner to start off with and then just work that across so you can see I'm taking a slightly deeper cut in that direction but not in that direction and then I'll do the same from the other side so slight almost 45 degree cut there work it down work it down work it down And it's interesting because you're still leaving a long bit on at the end. Yeah, I tend to leave that actually quite a, quite a while. Um, it's just a bit more material to grip onto. Um, and if I want to change the design, there's still a little bit of material to use. like now where I'm carving into that curve. You can carve it that way. Uh, I find I tend to twist my cut slightly if I'm carving in that way. So I tend to flip it around. I've got that extra bit of length to just do a push cut and get a nice, 
nicely into that curve. Hazel is a little bit fluffy, but not the end of the world. Yeah, do the other side now. So, again, 45 degrees in, work it flat. A little bit more out back there, it's not quite even. Again, this is easier to correct a bit later, so it doesn't need to be perfect now. Um, just needs to be roughly the right shape. It's a little bit easier to correct later when there's less material to remove. I feel like I say that a lot. <laughs> Cool, so that's the, uh, yeah, that's the side profile done. Um, just gonna bring that neck in a little bit more. Curve doesn't look right. Yeah, that'll do. So next job is I'm gonna put the Sloyd knife away and reach for a hook knife. Uh, the one I'm gonna be using today, I usually use a Tuca cam, but uh, I'm gonna show off the Scorp today. It's got a slightly smaller bowl and I've got, I think it just worked better for this shape actually. So I'm just gonna start out, I might use the Tuca cam later as well. Just gonna start out by roughing out the bowl. So I've got my index finger on the back of it just to, as a brace gives me a nice controlled, powerful cut. I just want to take off, or take out some of the middle of the bowl. I'm not trying to get a good finish at the moment or anything like that. Just simply taking material out. I will do the bulk of the hollowing doing this now, but then I'll carve the sides down a bit, so usually I have to edit it a bit later, but. Yeah, that's about as much as I need to do with the hook knife now. Just something to take that middle out makes it easier to access the sides, makes it easier to cut a clean edge on there. And needless to say, obviously, if people watching have just a simple spoon knife, then just use that. For yeah, you. yeah, you can do it with just a simple spoon knife as well. If you bear with me a sec, I'll grab another, uh, an actual spoon knife. <laughs> Traditional hook knife there. This, this one is a, I think this is the open curve from Robin Wood. Um, so you can just thumb on the back of the blade there, work your way across, or I've never been particularly comfortable with this method, um, which is why I use the Scorp and or the Tuca cam in the method I do, but you can also use it, just bring it down towards you like that. This one's lovely, it's got a really nice open sweep. So it's really, it gets a really nice smooth finish. I tend to use this one quite a bit for finishing cuts. Um, again, I've always struggled sort of with the back of the bowl doing that technique, so I tend to bring it around, use my finger to brace again, just use the end. In fact, I'm not going to use my finger to brace because it's getting in the way. 
but just I'm using the tip of this. A, a compound curve would be better for that job, but I can, I can do it. This is, it's a rough hollow for now. I'll clean up a bit later, I think. Pop that back away. And back to the Sloyd knife. Um, so next job uh, is I'm gonna basically define the top surface of my spoon. So I've got my side profile pretty much nailed now. Uh, so now I want to find my top profile. So start at the top of the bowl, try and start as close to the middle as possible. Just bring a nice even cut down to where that, that crank line is. Then same at the back of the bowl. You can work that way and meet down. What I tend to do is work at an angle and go across. So you can see that the grain, it's quite short grain, so it does chip out as you're going across it, but it means I can usually do this in one direction. So I'll start up here, cut, and then just by shifting my hand outwards, I can bring that cut in to cut into the neck there. And it's still, because it's cutting at sort of almost a 30 degree angle, even though it's cutting uphill on the crank, it's cutting downhill through the grain, sort of. Yeah, you can see, got a nice curve there. I maybe drop that a little bit further, just so there's not quite a steeper transition at the back. Yeah, and then I'll take the other side and bring it down, do the same. I know it looks like I'm sort of cutting towards my finger there, but it's actually a fairly safe cut. I've got, the thumb isn't pushing, the thumb is simply a pivot, so all the action is coming from me moving my, my whole arm, so almost chicken winging, basically. <laughs> Um, to get, so it's quite a controlled cut. There's no risk of me accelerating through it and cutting straight into my thumb at all or finger. And again, once I've got down to where my crank met, come across again, sort of keeping that angle, taking it out. There you go, you can see nice continuous curve there. There's a bit of a drop at the back, probably more than I'd usually put in, but it's nothing we can't carve out a bit later. So done the, cleaned up the top edge of the bowl. Now I'll move on to the handle. This is where having that extra length on the end helps. Start right up the top. In fact, first thing first, I'm just gonna put a couple of notches in here That way I can just see, if I carve off the top, I can still see where the end of my spoon was on the original design. So I'm probably gonna cut across there later, but if I cut those in, it still lets me know where I wanted to end up originally. So we'll just take off the top edge. We'll start cutting in more of a curve into this. Um, I think what Barn calls a, a, like a saddleback spoon. I call it a Pringle spoon because it looks like a Pringle. Um, yeah, we'll just start cutting that. So we'll take off that 45 degree angle, go most of the way. This one's a bit too cranky, so it's tearing out there, but. I don't want to go all the way to the neck. I tend to leave that curve till a bit later, but you can see that's added a nice downward sweep to the handle. Gets in that sort of classic dolphin profile that you guys would have seen in like Owen Thomas's spoons or something like that. Um, first cut, do the same on the other side then. So again, quite aggressive. I'm not quite as good at, on, at getting the curve right on that side. 
So I'll tend to, I'll go back with the slow knife afterwards, just with a thumb push to start the curve nicely and blend it in with the big curve I cut before. You can see I've got my rough curve both sides um, and then I'll just try and take out a bit more in the middle. So that was about 30 degrees and then I'll take a flat off there Flat off the other side. You see for these cuts, I'm starting about maybe a third of the way along the blade and then shifting to about two thirds of the way by the end of the cut. That's a nice sort of medium for an aggressive cut uh, and it keeps it flat rather than sort of diving in too far. If I want to add a, more, a curve, I'll use it closer to the tip where it can sort of dive in and dive out of the cut a bit easier. So. Just keep going like that, take off, like every time you make a new corner, go back and take that off until you work out roughly into the middle. And you can see there's a nice gentle curve going down there, then it gets a bit ugly when you meet this section because I haven't finished that yet, but go back in and we'll start a bit further down. I'm starting about an inch in from the end of the bowl and do the same thing again. Just taking thin cuts, you don't need to be that aggressive to make defining the shape. Just enough and you can take up. See, I'm using the tip of it here. That's just to put a bit more of a hollow into that. I'm cutting downhill all the way, so I'm sort of diving in and then coving back out. Again, you don't need to take aggressive cuts. Lots of fine cuts gets the job done just as quickly. There you can see that the curve flows most of the way down. Just I've got that ridge of the neck there, which I want to clean up. Uh, but that's a nice, nice curve. Sits nicely in your hand there. Nicely and got a nice, nice saddle back. You can see the curve. There's the curve that way, but then there's also the curve that way, which is what gives it, makes it really comfortable. Just sits under your thumb really nicely. Now I'll clean up the neck. I'll probably just blend that in to the front a little bit. Mm. Carved one side slightly deeper than the other. So just adjust that. Yeah, there you go. You can see nice curve that shallow curve that flows down there and then dropped into the back of the bowl. There's a little bit more crank there, it means you can tilt the bowl back if you've got a like a fairly liquidy stew or anything like that. Clean up the sides again. Uh, and then uh, move on to the back of the bowl. So I'll take a bit more weight out here before I finish hollowing. Um, I won't take it all the way, just take a, a bit more material. So I can be really aggressive with these cuts. So start off 45 degree. You can see how much material is coming off there.
still need to say that's quite a thick keel I've got at the moment, so I'll just take off a bunch there. You could do this as a chest lever, a uh, um, nice way to remove a lot of material. It's not a grip I've ever been particularly comfortable with, so i just use a thumb pivot I've got. You'll notice I'm using the right up at the sort of the belly of the blade for this. It gives you, A, it helps keep, keep the cut flat rather than diving in. Uh, it just gives you a bit more power as well. It's closer to your hand. So, yeah, a bit easier to control. Um, yeah, as you can see with the thickness of the bowl, that's about, about what I want to leave it at for now. Uh, I'll fix that a bit later once I've done the hollowing and I can sort of then start to see through it so I can I know how thin I'm getting. Next thing I'll do is clean up the back. Um, this is where I use a cut. I don't think I've seen many other people do. Uh, this is, it's almost like using the Sloyd knife as a mockage gun um, to hold it in reverse. Uh, I've got my thumb anchored on the back, thumb anchored on the side like that, holding the bowl of the spoon and pulling back towards me. It's a, it's a powerful cut, this, because you've got your whole arm pulling back rather than just sort of wrist or anything like that. If you do have access to a market gun, then it would be better, like this like, like curved tip keeps it away from your leg and anything like that. I haven't stabbed myself doing this yet, but... And then another cut to do this to hog some out, holding knife up against your knee and just pull the spoon blank through it. This has, I find, less control, but it's a lot more powerful. You're not moving the knife at all, you're just moving the spoon blank. You can see there's some nice big shavings coming off there. Again, don't just work sort of the same angle every time. If you're taking off just a big flat cut, just change it only a couple of degrees. Just makes things easier. If you take off, make a ridge, take off the ridge, make another ridge, take off the ridge. See, I'm getting down to this end now and that little bit of left on for the handle is now sort of getting in the way of it. It's a bit thick, so I'll then come in. Quite an aggressive cut. You can do this with a saw, it's quicker. I tend to do it with a knife just because I'm lazy and I don't want to reach for another tool. I'll cut most of the way, that's about two thirds of the way across. And then same from the other side. There we go, overall shape of it's a little bit more visible now. Yeah, I'm just having a look at the shape of this actually and the curves aren't really working. So I'm just gonna change up a couple of things and make that, bring that neck in a little bit tighter. Too much flare on the handle so I'm going to take off that outer corner it 
same the other side. It's a little bit better. It looks quite a pointy bowl now as well, so I'm going to take off a bit more of the front of that. That's where it helps, because I didn't rough out completely. I've still got a bit of length there that I can take out. Notice uh, cutting across end grain, I'll tend to work, keep, try and keep the knife at a 45 degree angle. Make a slicing cut, um, particularly with a soft wood like hazel. If you work just straight across the grain, um, you can chip it out or take out a medullary array. And again, I'll work 45 degrees, but away from my top edge of my spoon. Because if it does want to tear out, it's tearing out on the side that you're going to be recarving anyway. I've said that and then I've just completely done the opposite. Um, yeah, it's a slightly better shape. I've got my curves different up there. Yeah, it looks a bit more in proportion, I think. Maybe my handle's a bit long now. This is another reason I don't work with templates because I do change my mind about the spoon halfway through a lot. Uh, and there's there's things I don't like about them. And sometimes if I'm working with a template, a, a curve just sometimes doesn't look right. It can be exactly the same as the one previously, but it doesn't fit. So there's a bit too much of a curve there. Take that out. I'm going to take a little bit of length out of it, so I reckon maybe an eighth of an inch. Again, like, like I was taking that off that larger section earlier, it could be a nice aggressive cut to start off with. And then just blend it in. Looks a bit better, a bit more in proportion. Still looks a bit off, but I think that's just because I've got the neck quite chunky still. So I'll take that down a bit more. Yeah, that looks a lot better, I think. My curves are slightly different on the side, but... It looks a bit more in proportion now. A slightly shorter handle, a bit more belly on the curve, a bit more round, but a bit, bit of a tighter neck. I'm aware that half of my terms are just made up most of the time, so apologies for that. Yeah. 
yeah, I think I'm happy with that now. So I'll go back to cleaning up the back, taking a bit more material out. So I want to take stuff out the back of the shoulders there. So pulling the knife towards me, I've got the knife or the spoon in the way, cutting myself. Cutting across end grain there, so it's a bit tough going. And then just pivot out of the cut. See again, I'm, the knife is actually sort of still cutting in the same direction. I'm just moving the spoon blank, which enables me to change the direction of the cut. Rather than moving the knife all the time, the spoon is a bit easier to move. Certainly in that orientation, this side, it's a bit easier to move the knife. Find curve on the back of the keel. So starting on the sides, working in, it gives you another central ridge. And just take that ridge down. Blend that into the back a bit. Back of the spoon, you can always be a bit more aggressive than on the top. Like, I think top profile of spoon matters more for the comfort and back you can always change later. It's easier to change, I think. Curves are wrong again. Just need to change the back of that bowl a little bit. Tucks in a bit more on one side than the other. Helps every now and then just to use the silhouette, holding it up to the light lets you see symmetry. So I can see that side of the bowl the curve is a little bit more, a little bit sharper. So I want to take off a little bit, just going around that edge to even it up. Yeah, that matches a bit better. Happy with that. Put the slide knife away. Uh, do some more hollowing. To go with the scorp again for this. Um, again, still doing a bit more roughing out, so I'm going to be working across the grain. So I'm using sort of as close to the sort of the top of the curve as I can. It's a slightly tighter curve up there than obviously down here. There's a nice teardrop shape. So it's about, I think they're 38 mil radius at the top. But, and obviously a bit wider in the teardrop. So I'll start off with the top curve. I want to get relatively close to the edge here. Probably about an eighth of an inch in. Again, I'm not too worried about finish here because I'll go do some finishing cuts with the grain as opposed to across the grain in a second.
back of the bowl. Uh, this is where the scorp really comes in handy because it's a left and right side of hook at the same time. So I can use it. Push, cut, push into that corner. And the same the other side. There's a pull cut into that corner. So where before I was roughing out, cutting across the grain, now I'm gonna do some finishing cuts coming with the grain. So I change grip for this, anchor the handle of the spoon against my chest, choke up a bit on the hook and just bring it down at a slight angle, I try and follow the outside curve. And then when I get over to this side of the bowl, I'll switch grips again, anchor it against my leg, my hand sort of like holding holding a pen, I guess, but finger on the side of the bowl, thumb on the back, pushing it down into my leg to keep it blank locked in place. Index finger bracing the back of the hook, keep it steady and just bring it down across into me. I'm not putting a huge amount of power. The sort of the extra power is coming from that index finger pushing on the back of the blade. So there's very little risk of me pushing through a cut and ending up into my thumb, which is holding the back of the spoon. And again, you don't need to be taking aggressive cuts here. Finer cuts is going to leave a nicer finish and it hollows it just as quickly. Just come where it meets, come across grain again, just to clear out the waste. That's actually feeling a little bit shallow. So I'm just gonna rough out a little bit more. Hazel's one where it's got nice distinct growth rings. So you can sort of get a, get a gauge of how far through it you are. So I've probably got still maybe a quarter of an inch material there, which I'll take off the back rather than hollowing it too much. Yeah, that feels about deep enough. Then just come back to this method. Cutting with the grain down into the bowl. Gives a nice smooth cut. Let's clean up the top. The top I find it easier to do across the grain, but almost at a 45 degree angle. You can see I take a very small cut up here just to define that rim a bit come around the corner keep defining that rim just make it one nice clean line as far down to the lowest point of the bowl as you can Do the same from the back of the bowl. For this side, I'll do it with a push cut. Or if I was using an, a normal hook, pull cut, just bracing against the side of my finger again. Clean out the waste. And then just back down in that direction to smooth out any tear out. Same on the other side. I'm just gonna clean up that top of the bowl a bit again. I 
think I'm happy with that. Move on to work on the other side. This side, again, a bit more comfortable. You can work against your chest. Just taking a really fine cut, trying to follow the edge as close as you can. That's actually taking it a bit thin. That's not the end of the world. Just reach for a sloid knife. Take a little bit more off. And it just fattens up that edge a bit. Just spotted a couple of high points there. A high point on the top there. Yeah, that's a bit better. You just carry on hollowing. So I've done that edge along that side now. Now I just bring the hook from that back corner. I want to bring it round to meet. Clear out the ways to cross the grain. Smooth it up with the grain. Fix the middle a bit, it just wasn't quite looking right. Make it a nice even curve all the way around. Yeah, so that's the, well, that's all the hollowing done basically for the bowl. That that's, tends to be what I leave it at now. Um, this hazel is really quite soft. So I think once this one's dry, I'll probably go over it again. Uh, I can get a slightly crisper finish from it. Um, but now ready to move on, get the sloyd knife back out and just finish off the rest of the spoon. Cool. Um, I just want to grab my uh, Tuka can, this is a really large hook knife from Nick Westman. It's a 50 mil radius, slightly wider radius than the scorp I was using, so it's nicer just to clean up the back. So I use it in a very similar way, actually. I've got the long handle on it, so I can use it quite long, or I can use it two-handed for doing cups and stuff, but for spoons, I tend to choke up on it and just use my finger to anchor it in place again. That slightly wider diameter curve makes it easier to carve a nice flat curve across the back of this bowl.
Yeah, that'll do. Got a really nice cheap case. It's a really crappy little turn box I found on eBay, which had a split down the side. So I turned that split into a, into a, a sawn <laughs> slot. <laughs> Sloyd knife. Yeah, so the bowl's, bowl's basically finished now. Um, so I'm going to start profiling the rest of the spoon. I'm just going to change the top a little bit, add a li little bit more of a curve into that. So I'm going to be using right at the tip for this because I want to be putting in a bit more of a curve, taking off nice fine shavings. about right. Just got a bit of a flat in my curve there. Yeah, there we go. So now, yeah, happy, bit happy with that top. I'll start on the back of the spoon. I usually start on the bowl and work backwards. Now that it's sort of roughed out, so again, be still quite aggressive actually on this back corner, but take it down. I aim for about a millimetre and a half. I know I keep switching between metric and imperial, but it's just how I was taught technology basically. Same on the other side. I just want to get to that thickness at the edge, so that isn't sort of quite the finished angle, but I'll bring everything down to meet it in a second. Yeah, and then I'll start. I've now got created with, by doing that, aggressive chamber I've created a ridge there start at the back of that take that off you can see now where I was roughing out earlier I was using the belly of the blade I'm now using the tip of the blade just for a slightly more controlled cut a slightly lighter cut as well. Yeah, so got the curve nicely, comes down to meet the edge. There's a little bit more in the edge than I want there, so I'm just going to take a little bit more off that corner. Uh, 
and same the other side. Yeah, that's the front end of the bowl done. If I hold that up to the light, you can see how, I don't know if you can on the camera, you see how translucent that is. It shows I've got a relatively nice thickness. If it's a bright day, it's easier to see. If it's not, then I'll sometimes get my phone out, use the flashlight just to show that a bit better. You can see that's nice and even that's nice and thin at the top. Then when you get to the center of the bowl, it's still quite thick there actually, so I'll probably look to take a little bit more off, off there and then off the back of the bowl. Yeah, so if I take off, just cut out of the center, get it a bit thinner and then work out from there. Now we'll do the back of the bowl, transition into the neck. Um, again, I'm gonna be working pretty much across the grain with the slide knife. So I'll start, find the point on my side there where it's like, starts being about a millimeter and I'll start from there, just working in towards the neck. I'll get that as close in as I can Switch to do the same on the other side. And then you can see that cut has created a nice big ridge there that I can take off again. So I'll try and start where that cut cut starts, just take off that ridge, trying to get almost as flat to the grain as you can for this cut actually, and just work into the center. Again, bring it back, blend that. And then same the other side, take off that big ridge. I like to have quite a, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, thin, thin keel on the spoon. So what I tend to do now is using the tip of my knife, bring this, see where the, it follows, it's got a one, sort of one and a bit mil edge, bring that round. So I want to get that to about, about there or so. Um, so I just take a nice thin cut just along the edge to start off with, with the Sloyd knife, keeping that rim nice and thin on the back of the bowl and then further up in the actual back, take a bit more of an aggressive cut and just twisting the knife out of it to sort of almost hollow. You can do this with a spoon knife as well. A spoon knife lends itself a little bit better to cutting a hollow there. It just helps thin out that keel. You still keep a big central ridge but just thin it out sideways means you've got the depth so it's still strong, but the width so it still feels good in the hand.
and then just blend that in a bit if you need to. Do one last cut to sort of blend that shoulder in, just going towards the front of the bowl again, taking it off that ridge, working flat down to the sides. In fact, maybe one more cut. That doesn't quite blend very well. That'll do. A little bit more of that keel because it's got a bit pointy now. Yeah, that's about right. It's a bit uneven actually. That's all right. You can see I've got the long fibers referring through the bowl, going into the back there following on the length. So now I've got my bowl defined, back of the bowl, front of the bowl defined, clean up the handle and the transition into the handle. So start off with, I'm gonna work much like I was doing the side of the bowl. I'm gonna just follow along the side here. I wanna get that down to about a millimeter and a bit of an edge. I'm not worried about right at the end of the handle. I'll fix that in a second. Just on the widest parts here, get that down to meet, a nice thin section there, and just take a little bit of material out the middle as well. Flip it over, just hold it, see see if it's comfortable. It's, that's the right sort of thickness now, so I don't want to take any more off. Now, uh, end of the handle, I've got that one mil spot just at the widest part here. I'm just going to blend that into the back. So I'm going to, I want to follow that one mil line to the end while keeping that thickness. So they're going to be, it's going to be sort of more of a, whereas that's quite a shallow curve, this is going to be quite a tight curve. So I'll start off again, an aggressive cut at quite an angle, just to sort of define that edge. Same on the other side. That was a little too aggressive. You saw it split out then. You can see that's a very steep angle compared to the sort of shallowness I've got there. But then I can just bring that back, blend it in. So I've almost got a sort of two different semicircles, one a very wide one at this stage of the bowl, and then have quite a tight one just at the end of the bowl. I'll leave it at that sort of thickness, so I want the same sort of thickness there and there, um, but then I'll just take off that corner here, make it a bit more, just looks a bit better, I think so. Take it off, I'm gonna aggressive cut about 45 degrees. Start from one side, cut most of the way across, and then finish it off by coming from the other and meeting in the middle. Yeah, gives it a bit more of a sort of grace to the sweep at the end. Um, then uh, I'll clean up the back of the neck. So much like carving the neck or the back of the bowl that way, I'm going to do the same with the handle. I've got my one mil and a bit edge here. I want to start at the edge where that starts and just curve in towards the neck. I'm doing a slight sort of twist with the knife again so that I'm hollowing out almost. Cutting a slight curve inwards. Do the same on the other side.
and then come at it from the bowl side again. You can see I've got that Y shape from the keel where those facets blend into the sides. Now moving away from the keel, I can just blend those in. Take off a fine cut, like take off that ridge basically. You get two more ridges. Blends in. Sometimes you can get that bit of tear out where you're going quite the wrong direction or slightly the wrong direction doing that curve, so just approach it from the other side. Helps blend it in a bit better. Yeah, that's the back of the neck done. I want to clean up the transition here just a little bit. There's a bit of fluff. So you see it's right at the tip, the knife to get in there. come from the other side and again I'm using that slicing cut which almost lifts the fibers and then severs them so that hopefully I don't end up with sort of any fluffy bits it's not particularly working on this bit of hazel because it is very very green and it also might be because my knife is not very sharp but that's good enough. Cool. Um, yeah, that's largely that. I'm just gonna thin out the rim around here a bit, it's a bit chunky. But that's largely done. The next step, you'll notice um, across the neck here, it's pretty flat, whereas the, I've got a curve on the back of, the, back of it and the back of there. For this type of spoon, I like to add a little cove into the neck. Here, this um, something I took from uh, a barn and spoon design, actually, uh, on this, his thousand, thousand spoon tree. Um, just take a curve, come in from that side, come in from on top here, And do the same on the other side. You see, I'm not actually cutting that far into it, but it just narrows the top down, but keeps the width lower down the neck, so you don't lose much strength, but it just makes it look a little more delicate. There we go, so you can see it's much thinner on the top now, 
but you can see how it flares down the widest point at the back. So I've got a almost pentagonal shape to it now with a very thin top, sloped sides, sloped sides, and then comes in two points to the tip of the keel there. Um, trying to remember what I do next. That's, I mean, this is largely finished, so Hazel's, because it's so green, I would normally dry it before doing finishing cuts, but I'll just show what I do anyway. So first job will be, um, I take a very small cut going around the edges, um, just to bevel it off. So I'll start at the top of the bowl, corner, about 45 degrees odd. Try and blend it in with that line you created with the hook, or try and join it up with that line you created with the hook earlier. Work your way around. Because you're cutting, you are now cutting uphill, but because you're cutting at a 45 degree angle, you can keep going in the same direction. Come up into that cove. Same on the other side of the spoon. top of the bowl you just need to approach that from a different angle because it's very short end grain across there and then same for the handle so I'll start off right at the top I use my, the tip of my knife for this pulling towards me spoon anchored against my chest just take a very fine cut if your knife is sharp you don't need to worry too much about grain direction for this cut. It will usually cut through it on a nice fine cut, whatever grain direction you're going in. Just make it slightly wider, or the little bevel slightly wider as you join up with the bevel you made in the bowl, and do the same on the other side. That one is tearing out a little bit, so I'll just come up from the other angle. And the last one just across the top of the handle there. Yeah, and then I think I think I'll add a couple of little decorations to this. So these are things I picked up from Jared Dahl at Spoonfest a couple of years back. Um, little microfinial, so just a tiny little notch. I'll start off cutting in towards the handle. The blade, just a tiny little notch in there. Start in towards the handle first, otherwise you can risk chipping it off. And then the opposite direction. So you can see, tiny little notch. And you can just see, I don't know if you can focus on that that close. Just about. Yeah, you can see a tiny little notch just at the side. Just add something, it breaks up those curves, I think. It's, uh, I personally really like them. Do the same on the other side. That one's a bit fatter. So just even up that side again. Cool, there we go. And that is, um, yeah, finished spoon.
So here we go, we've got the finished one on the right, and you were just comparing it to one you carved before, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it was one, I was sort of trying to aim for this shape. Uh, you can see it's a little bit, that one was a little bit smaller, and this one's got a bit more curve to it, but um, that one was a nice bit of sycamore. Um, it was dried for a few days and then has been oiled, and that one's actually been baked in the oven with them um, for about half an hour or so, just to give it a bit more color, because it was, um, I find sycamore can go a very ugly yellow when you just oil it. So um, baking it makes it go, gives it a little bit more of a, a golden brown to it. Uh, and then this one's, it's an older one. This is a, a nice bit of beach, little crook, which has just had some linseed oil on it. So, so just a, a, a couple of things to wrap up the video, some of the buy. So in terms of drying, okay, what are you, what are your steps for drying your spoons? Um, once the spoon is carved, um, it, they're so thin that they tend to dry out pretty quickly. I've got um, a nice warm flat, so I tend to just take them home. I've got a set of shelves in there. I'll put them on, on the shelf where it's, it's nice and airy, gets um, good airflow, decent warm, warm room, no direct sunlight um, where it is. So it dries usually overnight. Um, usually leave it just for two or three days just to be safe. Uh, and then just pop a little bit of linseed oil onto it. So with the linseed oil, is that your preferred oil of use? Yeah, uh, I've, I've used a few others. I've, I've used walnut oil because I can get it at my local supermarket um, and it dries just as well. Um, but linseed oil, uh, it was just cheaper a while back. I think a couple of years back, I bought um, like a five liter or a gallon tub of it from uh, a pet shop actually. They sell it as a supplement, I think it was for horses. Um, and it's quite yellow when you get it like that. But um, Don Nalejti, I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that horribly, but he's got a very good instructional on one of these spoon carving Facebook groups um, on how to wash oil and refine it yourself. So I did that process using salt, sand and water to get some of the impurities out. And I've been going on that bit of oil ever since basically. Oh wow, so that reduces the yellowness. Yeah, it? it makes it a lot less yellow, so it doesn't, doesn't yellow the wood as much, but um, still protects it. Excellent. So, um, so in terms of spoon, that's, and that's really it then, in terms of the drying and oiling, that's your process? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Just a, f a few days of not paying attention to it, and then 10 minutes of oiling. <laughs> So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. And what a video it was. Sam, thank you so much. My pleasure, Zed. That was my first time that I've actually seen Sam's uh, entire process from start to finish. We've hung out at events in the past. I've seen little snippets. So it was really, really insightful for me and hopefully for yourselves too to see Sam's process from start to finish and a lot of kind of like good advice along the way. Um, so a couple of things I do want to mention as we wrap up this video. Number one, Sam has very kindly um, drawn up a template by the time you're watching this video. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do the following. Um, Sam has created a page on his website where you can do three things. Number one, you can download a template similar to the spoon that is carved in this video. Secondly, um, there is the option, should you want to, to purchase a spoon similar to what uh, Sam has carved in his video. Now he's gonna do just a limited run, once again, he doesn't do batch runs typically, but just for this video, he's gonna do a small batch run. And like I said, you know, if they're available by the time you watch this video, then that is the option, you know, should you want to, on that page, uh, to also purchase one of those spoons. One thing I will stress, and I stress this sincerely, that obviously everyone learns a little bit differently. One thing I found for myself, and maybe for yourself it will be the same, is by holding a spoon physically in person, it helps a lot with your process when you're first learning how to carve a particular style of spoon. I'm not sure what your kind of experiences are with that. Uh, that's definitely true. Like I, I, I taught myself spoon carving basically by buying other people's spoons. Yeah. Um, didn't do any course or anything. It just, it was things, was Pat, Pat, um, Pat Dietz, Amy, Amy Leek and Yoav, three, those three got spoons off them and that's how I taught myself basically. Yeah. Working out what, what made a good spoon. Yeah, but this is once you, it's one thing obviously seeing things on video and on photo, but it's a completely different thing when you're actually physically holding something. Like even today off camera, spending time with Sam, looking around, obviously talking about his spoon and his work. 
you, know, you get a much more different sense of kind of like how it feels in the hand, how it looks, what the profiles are like. So like I said, me personally, I'm not saying it with any intention in terms of what it is you need to do, but with me, every opportunity I get to kind of acquire a spoon, I do so, and it helps me a hell of a lot in my own learning. So like I said, on that page, as well as the template, there will be the opportunity, if they're still available, to buy you know, one of the spoons that you've seen Sam demonstrate in this video. Third, uh, Sam does have a newsletter, an email newsletter that he sends out. Now that is a fantastic way of finding out obviously what Sam is up to on a week to week, month to month basis. Um, there is the possibility, we spoke just off camera, that once Sam relocates to Scotland, that in the future there's no plans just yet, but maybe in the future there may be plans at some point when he's ready to start teaching as well. So by joining his newsletter, you'll be kept up to date if and when that happens. So like I said, there will be a link below to that uh, blog post on uh, Sam's website and on there you'll be able to download the template, potentially buy a spoon should you want to. And the third thing, it will mean the world to me if you actually join his newsletter. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a great way of keeping in touch with Sam and what he has going on. The second link I will put down is Instagram. Okay, so that will be a link also in the description. And it will mean the world to me as a way of saying thank you to Sam for showing his entire process that he's taken a long time to refine. Um, it will mean the world to me, secondly, as well as visiting the blog post, to also go to his Instagram profile and follow him on Instagram. He's very active on Instagram, so he posts quite regularly. And also, you'll be seeing the myriad of things that he makes. Not only is he very talented when it comes to spoon carving, but also turning, and obviously the chair making now, what he's doing his apprenticeship with. So, you know, you can see the myriad of things that he's up to on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I follow him quite avidly on Instagram, and so it's great seeing kind of what he gets up to on his kind of day-to-day -day kind of like, you know, carving uh, journey in terms of the spoons and turning and chairs, etc. So like I said, a link below will be to his Instagram profile. So it mean the world to me, you go and check both of those out. So before we wrap up the video, are there any parting words from yourself? Uh, no, I mean, I'm extremely grateful for Zed for the opportunity to show off a little bit, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> Yeah, as, as well as my own website as well um, as the chairs. I'm like, I'm quite proud to say that I'm launching a new workshop in in a few weeks' time. Maybe maybe it will start when this workshop comes out. So we might uh, pop a link to the workshop on, 100%, on there as 100%. well. 100%, yeah. And if by the time this video comes out, that website hasn't been launched by following Sam on his personal website, you, I'm sure you'll be yeah, updated. Yeah, definitely. It'll all be linked through. And my, be linked my through. Instagram is linked through to the, the Instagram for the work. But without there. a doubt, when and as the kind of website is launched for the chair maker, I will also put a link to that. And I think that will definitely kind of like, you know, require a separate video because that in its own right is a great craft. It's a yeah. very, very important skill. Uh, and Sam and the other apprentices are doing a, a very honorable job, to be honest with you, in trying to keep that alive. But Lawrence still is obviously retiring now, isn't he? So, you know, um, they're kind of keeping that skill alive. So, like I said, once again, Sam, a sincere thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for coming uh, down. You know, it'll be, it's great seeing you once again. It's been a long time since we've met up in person. So, like I said, guys, the link's below to both the blog post and also the Instagram down below. It mean the world to me, you go and check that out. Really sincerely appreciate you watching up until this uh, end of the video. We really hope you've enjoyed it. A sincere thank you to Sam once again, and a sincere thank you to you for watching this video. And as always, my friends, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Sam Cooper and myself at Outdoors, peace out.